Thanks everybody, it's great to be here. My name is Kirsten Paris and I'm the leader of the Clean Air and Urban Landscapes Hub based at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Yulukut Willem as the traditional custodians of the land on which we are recording our session. The Yulukut Willem are part of the Boon one of the five major language groups of the Greater Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their land, their ancestors and their elders, past, present and into the future. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all watching us today. All cities in Australia are built on Aboriginal land. All cities are Indigenous places. Despite the buildings, the roads, the concrete and the asphalt, country is still here. We can make our cities better places by highlighting the deep and ongoing connection that Indigenous Australians have to the land, the waters and the sky, and by making space for Indigenous perspectives in urban environments. Making our cities better places for people and nature has never been more relevant. During the coronavirus pandemic and the recent months of lockdown, city dwellers in Melbourne and beyond have found a stronger connection to urban nature and an increased appreciation for parks, gardens and other green spaces. People have been picnicking on golf courses, taking up bird watching and appreciating the fresh, clean air. In many cases, our urban dwelling humans are connecting more strongly to their urban places. So we have today with us an expert in each of these areas, and I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today. First of all, First of all we have with us Kirstine Wallace. Uh, who has connection to Yorta Yorta and, a Pala, and is a Palawa woman. She's a landscape architect, a sculptor, a public artist and a futurist. Uh, next to Kirstine, we have Professor Peter Rayner from the University of Melbourne, who's the acting director at the Climate and Energy College. And Peter is an expert in air quality, climate change and atmospheric chemistry. Next to Peter, we have a Marco, Marco Amati, Associate Professor at RMIT Centre for Urban Research. Marco is an expert in urban greening policy, urban forest canopy mapping, and community and psychological reactions to green spaces. And then we also, at the far end of our panel, last but not least, Lee Harrison, who's an urban ecologist with the City of Melbourne. And Lee today is here to offer a local government perspective on all things urban, greening, biodiversity and air quality. And Lee has worked very closely with community members in the City of Melbourne through a variety of outreach programs. The Call Hub is funded by the Australian Government's National Environmental Science Program and is a consortium of four universities. The University of Melbourne, RMIT University, the University of Western Australia and the University of Wollongong. And I'd like to acknowledge all our colleagues in the call hub today. So, I'd like to start with a question for Kirstine. Yes, Kirsten. <laughs> so, what are your thoughts on people's newfound or strengthened connection with urban nature through these recent months of lockdown? Uh, how do you understand this desire to engage with nature as a landscape architect, an artist, and as an Indigenous Australian? What a great question. It has been a full-on year, hasn't it? I mean, we've really come un under some incredible conditions in Melbourne, and we've all been so strong and resilient. We've all had great leadership and been a great community. I'm really proud of Victorians. Um, but yeah, we've, we've learnt to exactly what's in our 5K, haven't we? Um, we've been forced to, to be restricted um, to 
to a 5K radius um, that we've just got out of. And um, that time of knowing what what's in your local area, what's in your neighbourhood has been just so important. Getting out of the home for an hour and testing what's out there, um, exploring your local parks, your local creeks. Um, and it's been such a diverse experience for a lot of people because some people are not, are not, they don't have that creek there, they don't have that park. They may have a, a small playground um, which has had danger tape all over it for, for months and months and months. I think that's one of the, the saddest things I saw. I actually did a photo shoot going around at all these playgrounds with caution tape all over them. Just, yeah, it's very sad. But, yeah, we've, um, we've learnt to, to look and to listen and to take that detail in of our environment. The same Groundhog Day, the Groundhog Day of Groundhog Days of seeing that same walking path and seeing our environment change over the seasons. Often we're so scattered, you know, we're, we're everywhere. We're going to this state and that state and going on a plane here and exploring there. But for once we actually stayed in the one spot and we were able to look at that detail. You know, I couldn't have got through without looking at all the birds, um, noticing the frog habitats, noticing the way the weather changes and letting the, the trees tell me what's going on, noticing the little little nuances in the weather patterns and um, just seeing nature be able to talk back to us. Um, we've been able to see our paths and, you know, even though it's the same repetition, you notice different things and you play, you play with, with what's around you. Um, I started reciting the botanical names of, of the trees and the plants that I knew. Um, I, was, I would do that all the time and when I didn't know, I'd go back and I'd go, oh, I should know that. And, um, and then I'd go on to, to just picking a couple of different species and seeing how many of them I could see on my... 5k walk. Um, then I got onto the citizen science apps. How good have they been? They've really kept kept us going. Kirsten, you you know a lot about them more than I. I just I just soak them up. But you've really championed some of these beautiful apps. Um, so I think a lot of the community's been bird counting in their backyards. And there's been um, what's your frog one? Uh, there are a couple of different frog apps. There's the Frog ID app, which is um, uh, hosted by the Australian Museum. And then the Call Hub also has our Call Urban Wildlife app. That's where, what I've been using. Yes. Excellent. Uh, which allows you to conduct surveys of frogs, flying foxes, beneficial insects, and possums and gliders as well. Yeah. And it's amazing what you're noticing, you know. Um, things that you'd walk past... Um, just in your normal time, like you, you take this path on your walk and then, you know, next time you go on your walk or you go down the beach, but we haven't been able to do that. We've been doing the same walks and noticing the detail, noticing what our, our communities are bringing forth, um, seeing people do weeding at voluntarily, this, um, you know, seeing people put weeds onto the path and then you go, excellent, I'm going to do that too. Um, just little bits of... Um, our, our community doing things for each other. And then there was um, Spoonville. How good was Spoonville? Did you guys get Spoonville in your neighbourhood? Yeah. As cute as. Just gives you a little rush of, like, I'm not here alone. And, I mean, the birds and, and you know, nature tells us that we're, we're not alone. You know, we are nature. And you're never alone when you've got all these stars and all this all these birds and these fish and these insects saying hello. But, um, yeah, we've had a lot of alone time and a lot of time to think about our environments and how lucky we are to have such spaces. But some, some spaces can be a lot better and um, the, the plantings, the, the habitats, the ecology uh, needs to be really built up. We've lost 
what did I read today? Since 2013, 69% of our urban um, green, green space, um, which is incredible. Like, if we're going to do anything towards climate change, it's got to go extremely the other way. So, yeah, we really need to look at our local government areas and encourage them to, to make sure our parks, our bike paths, our connection, not just for humans but for um, animals to have pathways, connective pathways across highways, um, access to our waterways. The whole big picture of the ecology needs to be brought together and supported by all our people. Thanks, Kirstine. Uh, so, cities have faced many challenges in recent decades and uh, the coming decades will also present us with many challenges. Climate change, including increasing uh, prevalence of extreme heat events and drought. Uh, we have a loss of urban green space, as, as Kirstine has been mentioning. Uh, changes to air quality, a lot of threatened species and ecological communities are, are under pressure from urban environments in Australia. And uh, also with recent bushfires, we experienced some very poor air quality in Australia too. So how can the work of the Call Hub be brought together to uh, address some of these challenges? Well, over the last six years, we've had a team of researchers working on many of these important issues. And some of the key findings from this work can be found in our new e-book um, that I'll be sharing with you here for the first time today. <laughs> Here's our beautiful new e-book, Cities for People and Nature, um, with wonderful illustrations and artwork by Dixon Patton. Got a variety of chapters in here. This is just uh, the start of the air quality chapter, but the, the book considers cities as indigenous places, the themes of air quality, urban greening, urban biodiversity, and future cities, how we can make our cities in the future better places for people and for nature. Thank you. So, how will we know that we are making our cities better? To do this, we need to measure our cities and monitor them over time. And this brings us back to a range of research done by the Call Hub, uh, which has been considering threatened species in urban environments, measuring just how many of our threatened species live in cities and keeping an eye on how they're progressing into the future. We've also uh, been considering nature-based strategies to reduce urban heat and the monitoring of urban vegetation. So, Marco, would you like to comment on measuring and monitoring our cities into the future and, and the importance of this? Yep. Um, thanks. Thanks, Kirsten, and thanks, Kirstine. It's uh, great to be here on this panel and to be able to talk about this. Um, I guess over the six years in call, uh, as, as researchers, what we've done is to sort of assume different kinds of roles that involve um, interpreting and translating data and making it uh, understandable, I guess, for the broader community. So one of the things that we've done, for example, is to employ uh, new techniques of measuring where trees are uh, so that uh, local governments, for example, can understand better whether their neighbourhoods are actually um, growing in terms of greenery or going backwards. And that has a, a really big impact on people's lives because as the climate is changing, um, the outdoor environment is getting, I guess, you could say more and more hostile to life uh, during certain times of the year. And greenery provides a really important buffering capacity that prevents um, extremes, especially in terms of temperature or rainfall. 
So it's uh, really important for governments at different levels to be able to understand uh, how much greenery there is. And um, what we've done is produce maps and data in different cities like Perth and Melbourne and Sydney, uh, especially through my, the work of my colleague, Joe Hurley. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, shall I go on about all the other things we've done in detail? Yeah, okay. And <laughs> um, we've, uh, we've, we've worked at sort of different scales, I guess. So one of the things uh, we did was to, um, partly through funding from uh, the Smart Cities and Suburbs Scheme, uh, we, de we decided that the usual heat maps that people get um, are not easily interpretable enough by most people. So what we did was to package that heat information into a route planning app that enables people in the city of Greater Bendigo to be able to say, I'm going to walk from, say, here to uh, the railway station, um, and it'll find you the coolest route using that heat map. Um, so that's one of the things we did at sort of a very local scale. But maybe at a, a bigger scale, you could look at the example of um, the Australian Urban Observatory um, and the work of uh, Melanie Davin, uh, which provides a kind of platform where people can just log on and they can see all sorts of different information about their neighborhood area, um, right down to how far away public transport is, um, how many parks there are within a 400 meter radius, and all sorts of very useful information that will tell them or not whether their suburb is livable. And that's really important because what that does is it generates a lot of knowledge and the knowledge then translates into action. So that's uh, basically what we're about. Thanks, Thanks Marco. Peter, would you like to comment on air quality monitoring and measuring throughout the hub? Sure. And in fact, the recent history with COVID has given us a pretty interesting kind of backdrop for this. You, everyone will have heard comments on emissions are down such and such an amount because of the pandemic or pollution has improved in, in cities around the world, including our own, um, because of the pandemic. We only know that because we've got long-term records in place that enable us to see what cities are doing, what the air quality is, is, is trending like and what the variations are from good days to bad days. It's really striking for us that the pandemic came off the back of the bushfires. So we're able to see kind of the worst and the best of air quality over the space of just a couple of months. We were able to watch these spectacular drops and this, this cleanup in the air, not always for the, the, the easiest of reasons to deal with, but it gave us a chance to think about what cities might look like if they were cleaner, if they were quieter, um, if they were perhaps uh, less dominated by the vehicles that some of us can hear in the background at the moment. And it's, it's, it's kind of given us an alternative view. One of the things we were trying to do across the life of call was to go from this broad brush idea of what cities are doing as a whole to really getting local. And I mean really local. I mean an individual carrying around an air pollution monitor to see what they're experiencing as an individual each day at home, in their car, in their office, on their bike. And so we, we set up these, these measurement campaigns uh, to try and understand what individuals were seeing and to see what really local communities were seeing. There's, uh, we, we kind of pioneered this in Western Sydney where there was some quite strong concern that the kinds of measurements that were giving a broad perspective for the city might not represent what communities were actually suffering because there's a pretty strong uh, kind of variety of industrial activity and, and major transport routes and so on. So uh, were we actually capturing what people were really being exposed to? And that turned out to be a good news story. It, it turned out that, in fact, we were getting a good picture, that there, we, we didn't find really strong local hotspots that were kind of permanent and placing people at risk. What we did find was that the way you behave, both in your vehicle and where you travel and where you stand and where you wait and where you walk, all has a pretty strong effect on the kinds of air pollution you're exposed to. So we saw that places like intersections of roads have surprisingly strong spikes in small particles that can get into your lungs. 
Um, you just need to be a little distance away from those roads on, say, you know, one block across on a minor road. Exactly the same kind of thing that Marco was talking about with a route planner for avoiding the hottest areas. You can also have a route planner for avoiding the most polluted areas. And the responsibility lies in the other direction too. It turns out that one of the reasons why air pollution is worst at intersections is because cars have to wait there. There's no reason for those cars to be running. So we kind of were able to also highlight not just that this variety existed, but the reasons it happened and what could be done about it. We also had a good look at the indoor environment and how that interacts with the outdoor environment. So it, it turns out that for a long time, we've thought of the indoors and the outdoors as being kind of two totally separate domains, but there's in fact quite a bit of exchange between them. So one of the things we discovered uh, when looking at the effects of the very heavy smoke load that places like Sydney and Canberra and a little bit Melbourne got exposed to through the bushfire season was just how much and how little buildings can do to protect us, that the idea of staying inside to stay safe uh, from the smoke might work for a while, but it didn't necessarily work for a very long time. And similarly, the kinds of ways that we heat our houses. Uh, there are you know, a, a range of things that drive these local variations that we were seeing. So our, I think our, our big step was to move from this quite broad perspective down to understanding the detail, understanding how the detail mattered, and understanding what we could do about that detail. Thanks, Peter. Lee, would you like to comment on uh, some of the work the City of Melbourne has been doing to monitor biodiversity and other aspects of the environment? Okay, thanks, thanks Kirsten. Um, hold this close. So, I guess um, the work that we do on biodiversity in the city is really driven by our nature in the city strategy. And so our Nature in the City strategy has sort of multiple goals and lots of actions and lots of things that we want to do. So um, if I think about those in sort of broad categories, we've got the kind of biodiversity stuff that we that we monitor. And um, I think I'm probably channeling one of my colleagues here who um, says that you can't change what you don't monitor. So we monitor a lot of things in the city and they're not all biodiversity things, but they're all very... Uh, relevant for improving biodiversity. Well, not all of them, but many of those are things are very relevant. So um, the main things that we monitor with biodiversity are really the things that we change. So um, one of the goals in the strategy, one of the actions, is um, to improve, increase the area of understory vegetation. And that target was set because um, we know that understory vegetation is really important for improving biodiversity. So we've got that target to increase understory vegetation by 20%. Um, and so that's been interesting to sort of uh, keep tabs on that. And that is slowly going up. And we, we didn't know how hard that would be. So, you know, this is our first strategy. So we have to sort of dip the toe in the water and see what happens. Um, is this going to be really difficult, really expensive? And um, so far we're tracking pretty well. Um, we've also, we've got the work that we did with Cole on the um, connectivity index the linking nature in the city framework um, and that's been really um, that's a really important part of our delivering our strategy so that's an action um, to improve ecological connectivity and to uh, find a way to do that systematically and so the, that strategy has been really important for even for me just communicating internally in the city when we have lots of projects going on everybody wants to know how can I help? Um, and so you send them that document and you say, like, they've never really thought about animals moving across the city. And you go, and they look at that straight away and say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, frogs can only hop and birds can fly. And, like, those are pretty obvious things. But until you have it in front of you and go, all right, actually, I do have to think about, you know, because they, they just want to do everything. And you say, you can't do everything. We have to, you know, in a, in a particular intersection, you have to think about what you can do in that place at that time. So... It's been a really good communication tool for explaining to lots of different professionals about what, um, what we can target in different places. Fantastic, thank you. Kirsteen, did you have anything you'd like to add here about um, measuring and monitoring the urban environment? Well, it's something that Indigenous people have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years and uh, it's really great that contemporary society is 
bringing that practice in and being able to use things like citizen science apps to collect data and bring it back to the experts. Um, this sort of thing happens in traditional Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lifestyle. It's been happening for hundreds of thousands of years and that beautiful, um, incredibly detailed framework um, helps, has helped, you know, manage the, the landscape, the country, um, all the way through, bringing, bringing that responsibility down to the individual and then getting that to come back to um, the elder or the, or the expert um, to be able to manage that. Um, this is something that we can all do as a practice and it's really wonderful to, to see people doing that. It's something that doesn't matter what background you come from, you can, you can still um, be able to notice things and be able to feed back into the bigger picture to help, the, to help not just you and your family but to help the, the big picture, the whole environment. So I think that we're, we're getting somewhere. We're changing as a community. Um, we're being a lot more responsible, you know, with our environment. We're looking and we're seeing that detail and, you know, our, our kids are coming through and, and doing that and participating. You know, we're not just these little, little um, solo units where um, there's opportunity to act as a collective, even if we are in ISO, and, and that's been awesome to see. Um, so, yeah, I think we'd, we've done a great job in, in Victoria. Um, I'd like to see more of it and, and really encourage people to look at some of these apps and look at what's under your feet and in your neighbourhood. Um, have a look at what beautiful plants are around and, you know, not just the plant itself, but look at the bird that takes the nectar and look at, you know, think about where that bird's going and where that bird's been. I've been looking at a lot of seabirds and going, wow, I wonder what you've seen over the last few weeks and where you've migrated from, you know. Um, yeah, just have a look at the detail of what's around you. Thanks, Kirstine. And I'll just add there that uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, measuring the threatened species that live in cities has found some really surprising results uh, that 370 uh, federally listed threatened species live in cities around Australia. And of those, 39 of them are urban restricted species, which means that they don't live anywhere else. Their entire distribution is within a city. Uh, many of those are plants that uh, had a fairly small range that was taken over by um, buildings and houses and other aspects of the urban environment. Uh, but there are also a number of um, urban restricted threatened species that are animals such as the western swamp tortoise in Perth. So uh, part of the work we've done is with the hub is to highlight that cities aren't just places for boring biodiversity, but they're actually really important places for um, threatened species and ecological communities. And with the, uh, all the, the more enthusiastic connection to nature that we've been seeing uh, in recent months, I think people will be acknowledging that um, the value of urban, urban biodiversity in uh, a way that they haven't done before. And I think that's going to be really exciting. So uh, turning now to practical solutions that we've developed through the hub to address some of these um, urban challenges. Uh, Peter, would you like to comment on um, some findings for travel? Well, I think you may have commented on this already, but expand a little bit on how we can use this uh, new understanding of variation in air quality to, um, to help people navigate and reduce the pollution they're exposed to. Sure. And this was a real surprise to us. It was, a, it was kind of in a growing area in research over the last few years, and that the, the hub's been centrally involved in this, was discovering just how much pollution varied. And part of it was we started to measure some different things. We started to measure some... Um, small particles that can get deep into our lungs and cause a whole range of health problems, which we hadn't been able to measure for a long time. And so suddenly how these things started to vary and what 
produced them and how they evolved over time in a place like a city became really important and interesting to us. And so we were part of a, a series of studies that started around Sydney um, that were really concerned with some of the sharp episodes of poor air quality that Western Sydney had. West, the shape of Western Sydney means that if the air is flowing from a particular direction, pollutants can get trapped there. And because there's a lot of people and there's a lot of industry and there's bush around and some of the things that it produces can interact with our own pollution to cause problems, um, we really needed to understand what they were doing. But understanding isn't quite enough. Um, it's not much help if you know, well, you've got a problem, that's unfortunate. What can we actually do about it? Well, a few of the things we learned were that this pollution really varied a lot in time. And so if we could get much better warnings out to people, uh, we could tell people who were susceptible. So that's people who are older, people that are suffering from chronic health conditions, particularly lung uh, conditions, that today's a day you should be careful. So you might have noticed in the last few years around Australia that there's been warnings now about pollen, high pollen days. Uh, and that's come out of some parallel work. Uh, we would really like to extend that in much more detail into the pollution story. We have something now. We're starting to get some air quality forecasts. And there's now quite a lot of impetus, partly come out of, coming out of work that we've done, to drive uh, a, a detailed and, and kind of continuous air quality warning system that can tell people, today's the day you should be careful. That's on the exposure side. But what about on the, the, the causal end of the problem? Um, once again, we were able, by looking at the really detailed level, to discover that things like idling cars are an unnecessary problem. So as a purely practical guide, if you're waiting at an intersection for more than 10 seconds and your car is running, you're damaging your car, you're wasting money, and you're damaging the environment. It, it, it turns out that the, the modern engine prefers to be turned off and restarted when it, when it needs to be. Um, it doesn't like to sit there. It's producing pollutants. You're actually exposing yourself to a higher than average level because everybody else is doing this and your air intake is taking in what they're producing. And the poor pedestrians that are waiting at the traffic lights are getting more than their fair share as well. They're also wasting fuel. Uh, so in lots of countries now, it's uh, kind of part of the driver education to turn your car off uh, when, when you're sitting still. If you're at the school pickup in a parking area, uh, picking up the kids, those kids are small. They're often pretty at a, a much closer level to where that exhaust is being produced. Again, uh, if, if you have to wait, just turn the car off. Um, there's this whole range of, of fairly simple things we can do. Another thing we've noticed is that, uh, uh, perhaps surprisingly, the wood heaters that we all love so much in our houses are actually a significant cause of pollution. Um, they're, uh, a, um, a major cause of these small particles, and if they're not functioning well, there's also a range of other rather nastier chemicals that can be produced both indoors and outdoors by these things. Uh, and it's another case of, yes, we might like them indoors, but they might necessarily be good for our neighbors. So it's kind of just one of these things to, to consider when you're thinking about how the house should be heated, um, that uh, modern uh, cooling and heating systems are very efficient, uh, if you're using renewable energy, they're very environmentally friendly. And there's, so there's a range of these kinds of things that you can do in your house, in your car, um, and in the way you travel by avoiding these hotspots of pollution that can be good for yourself and good for the rest of, the, of your, of your neighbours and the people you share the city with. And probably, although we know rather less about this, uh, the effect of all that pollution on the plants and animals we share our cities with is a kind of uh, an, a burgeoning area for research. Thanks, Peter. Marco, did you want to comment on some other practical solutions we've developed through the hub's work? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I, I, I guess one of the things we, I, I mean, just thinking about what Peter was saying about um, risk and kind of uh, communicating risk to people, um, we've, we've worked quite a bit on, on translating of research impacts and uh, I remember in 2017, for example, um, we worked on uh, 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 trying to understand how much local governments were greening or not, but also what their overall risk profile was from a socio-economic and heat perspective. So, um, you know, we, we know that there's a, an issue, I guess you could say, of ecological justice. Different parts of the city are affected by heat in different ways, just in the same way that Peter was talking about with air pollution. 
It's the same thing with heat, and it's the same thing with the um, buffering capacity of the urban environment to accommodate that heat. So some areas which are newly subdivided, um, they don't have as much greenery, uh, the, the housing may be cheaper, uh, people have less capacity to actually afford air conditioning, and so they can be more heat affected, and there's a problem there of um, environmental justice for those people. So um, I guess that's one of the things is to make uh, decision makers. Um, I'm sure local government's well aware of this, or at least decision makers, uh, at least to support local government in uh, advocating for uh, better environmental justice from that perspective. Yep. Thanks. I wonder if I can just uh, break the rules here and cut in and say we also discovered that areas that are hot generally have poor air quality and that some of the extreme heat that Marco was talking about actually makes the air quality worse as well. So there's been really strong and unusual kind of communication between the different kinds of research that we've been doing on these questions. Lee, would you like to add something here from the local government perspective regarding either the examples that Peter and Marco have just given about practical solutions or some other approaches that uh, you see coming out of the Call Hub's work? Um, first of all, it's really interesting to hear about the um, air quality stuff. It's not something that I think about a lot, except when I'm standing at a traffic intersection. Um, and urban and cooling is very much a focus of our work. So I'm in the urban forest and ecology team at the city in the Parks and City Greening branch. And, um, you know, that sort of uh, has two underlying drivers. So there's the cooling of the city and then there's also the protection and um, enhancement of biodiversity. So sometimes those things come in conflict. Um, and it's, you know, it's our team's job sometimes to try and balance those conflicts. Um, and that's where looking for solutions comes in, is trying to balance those conflicts. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a call project, our streetscape biodiversity project, yes? Um, so that's working, I work with a lot of call researchers, <laughs> but I'm not sure which ones are call and which ones are just projects. Um, but yes, okay, so that project is definitely creating solutions for our understory, meeting our understory target. So that's about, um, we've got a, it's on our website now. It's called the Urban Nature Planting Guide. And that's um, a bunch of plants that are good for biodiversity that can be grown predominantly in streets and harsh urban growing conditions. So that's a really important tool that we can use internally and that we can share um, now externally because it's on our website. So, and then we use those case studies to communicate. You know, People are often really interested in what the city is doing, so it's great to be able to share those case studies and help other people, other uh, decision makers um, to to find solutions to their problems as well. So we have a lot more work to do. There's, it's a very challenging space screening the city. Um, so it's exciting to work with um, so many great researchers and helping us finding those solutions. Thanks, Lee. Kirstine, did you want to add anything about um, practical solutions developed through the hub? Practical solutions. <laughs> practical solutions. Uh, perhaps um, some of the work we've uh, been developing regarding the three-category approach? Oh, yeah. Um, the three-category approach is a framework um, that is all about communication, collaboration, and co-designing with Indigenous people, um, with our First Nations people. So. It's a, I've been able to facilitate a few workshops, both in person and online, to give people practical solutions, I guess, <laughs> to, um, to be able to have a good yarn and connection with our First Nations mob. So this is, um, in the past, whether it's as students and, and researchers, academics or... Um, in government or, or private practice, um, the, the communication with Indigenous mobs has been a bit questionable, uh, a lot questionable in some cases. There's been a lot of um, people going off and, um, you know, thinking they're doing good, but then just running off with knowledge and not um, respecting and giving back to community, um, you know, the one thing is to, you know, it's 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 really great to to encourage people to 
to communicate with Indigenous mobs, but um, there's been a lot of cultural appropriation, there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of papers being written, but those papers end up getting dusty on a shelf and community doesn't benefit from that amazing work that's being done. So um, through the, the three-category approach framework, um, it's a way of encouraging people to communicate and collaborate and co-design, but giving practical steps um, to encourage the best, best practice to be able to do that. Um, so there's a lot of um, different protocols um, that, that you should know about before you start. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, by listening instead of talking. Um, that's a big one. And um, just doing some, some even though you're, you might be the expert in the field, um, there's a lot of mob in community, in, in First Nations community that know so much and so much about our environment. And it's not just the environment here and now, it's seriously thousands of years of knowledge about how the environment has changed and gone through different survival events. Um, there's, there's stories of, um, say, a, you know, a, an asteroid coming down. There's stories of massive fire events. There's stories of um, deep survival. And, and um, you know, those, those stories are, are amazing if you get the opportunity to hear because... This isn't the first time that that humans have gone through massive change, and Australian stories have been able to be passed on through really careful protocols to be able to um, to keep and memorise these stories. Um, they're all through oral culture. So having a yarn with someone, having that building that time in to have a yarn. Um, sitting down and, and asking, you know, putting your perspective forward and going, I come here with this purpose. What do you, what do you think about it? How can we work together um, to, to create an outcome that, that would be really good? But what can we give? How can we reciprocate back to community so that that local mob can actually benefit from it? So whether that's through... Uh, whether it's money or whether it's something else like um, translating into, you know, that research back into language or being able to do something that the, the community can actually benefit from. Um, so the three-category approach, really, really good ways and steps to be able to methodically work through. Um, sometimes things feeling too hard if you, you know, a lot of people... Um, express being a bit, um, a bit tentative to to approach, um, you know, different communities, and um, it does need that that safe advice to to be able to go. Okay, it's it's, it's fine, but just just be really careful. Do a lot of time, like budget time, into your projects. Um, get your expectations. Um, from the start, with building in a really building in a really good relationship, um, you can't just go in and go on Monday. I need, I need this by Monday. It doesn't quite work <laughs> that way. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good steps you can take, but um, knowing knowing that listening is the main thing, patience and listening, deep listening. Thanks, Christine. So, turning now to practical things that uh, urban professionals, such as architects and designers, could do uh, to make our cities better, but also considering just members of the community, uh, what are the things that we can do at, at different scales uh, to make cities better for people and for nature? Um, who would like to uh, offer a comment here? Uh, I've been noticing all these little parklets come out. <laughs> Lee, do you do you have anything? A, a parklet? I've 
it's a term that I've come across um, just just in the recent past because our our people can't pack into restaurants, so the the gathering spaces are moving out into car parks and into cycle lanes, which is not too good. But um, we have to move out, we have to spread out. And so this, this term of, of parklets is coming out where there's um, a car park of maybe three to six car parks and it'll have some tables and chairs that are socially distanced um, to be able to have let people mingle because um, it's been a long time. We haven't even been able to sit on park benches, but now there's these little parklets. Have you seen them? I'm not sure I've... I, I, probably, but I guess we just probably don't call them parklets. Um, so I haven't had much direct involvement with this, but the city is certainly working very hard to increase outdoor dining space for restaurants and things. So we've been working... You know, our other people around the city have been working very hard to get planter boxes with trees and indigenous vegetation and all sorts of stuff. Um, a very short notice out and about so we can provide those enclosed spaces. So, um, yeah, that's been a huge amount of work going into that. So if that's what you call a parklet, then, yes, there's a lot of work going into those. Um, yeah. Um, Marco or Peter, did you have thoughts about... Um the, the role of the um, urban design professional in uh, making cities better? Over to you, Peter. You go first. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly... I mean, it, it, it's one of these things I was highlighting the last time I was chatting about what we could do as individuals, but there is a lot that can be done about the, the way cities work, um, how much travel we need to do and what type it's going to be that's going to be an issue, a problem we're thinking through in the next few months as we come back to work, how are we going to get there? What's that going to do for the air quality? Um, there's also quite detailed work. Again, this, this, this comment on detail that we've been making throughout, that the, the detail matters. It matters what your buildings are like. It matters which way they face. It matters where the balconies are. It, it, it matters the kinds of spaces that you spend your time in as to how you're going to get exposed to the, the, the kinds of pollution that are going to happen in cities for, for a good while. Um, it matters the kinds of balances that we make around the incentives we give people to travel in various ways. The whole work from home thing is going to be really interesting for air quality in the next little while. Our indoor spaces, the, 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 the quality of air that we're exposed to there in our homes is going to matter more. It's going to affect our health more. It was always really important and always largely ignored. We thought about offices because someone gets in trouble if the office has bad, um, is, is making people sick. Now our houses might matter a bit more than they did. Um, the detail as to just how often we come into the city uh, is going to change the kinds of patterns of where pollution happens and the patterns of the way people are exposed to it. So there's, there's quite a lot of details that I suspect are really keeping planners and, and transport planners and, 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 um, and the kind of people designing building codes up at night now to think about what's, what's the right buttons to push, to change, uh, to, to adapt to what might be some small changes or that might be quite big in the, the kinds of impacts and exposures that we as individuals and communities have to air quality through our cities. Um, well, I, I guess I just wanted to add uh, to what Peter's saying about the right buttons to push, but also to try to um, talk a little bit about what Kirstine was talking about with, in, you know, and I, I kind of take issue with this term engaging with, um, with country or with indigenous people, uh, especially from uh, kind of a, a white, originally non-Australian uh, individual myself. And I kind of want to say really how important the three category approach has been for me in my own research um, to just, I guess, try as much as possible to realize that in a way it's not enough to engage, but it's also to realize that one's own uh, objectives fall very much in line with the objectives of local indigenous Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people of the country. And to realize that actually, um, I remember Zena Cumston 
telling me that you know it's all about actually realizing that stuff just works much better when you engage with uh, the local people of the area, and that fits completely with what planning practice is all about. So you know, from that perspective, it's very easy to push at an open door. But on the other hand, you know, you've got to look at the language that planners use, and I'm, I'm actually a planner, so I know, but you talk about town and country planning as if those things are separate. Well, that kind of runs completely against the notion of country, or you think about the term greenfield development. Well, usually after greenfield development has occurred, it's not very green and there aren't many fields, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's, it's very much a, a process of obliterating country. And I think that um, as much as possible, it's to get colleagues of mine to recognize that in a quiet and polite way um, to try to push for some sort of change. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks all. Uh, some work that I've led with colleagues within and beyond the hub has been focused on how we can uh, plan for biodiversity in the city. So this is a, the seven lamps of planning for biodiversity. Marco was part of this team. And uh, we brought together the mindset of the ecologist and tried to highlight principles from ecology that can be applied by planners and architects, landscape architects, uh, engineers and other people involved in building the, uh, the built environment to see if we can align our mindsets in a way that we're considering not just planning for humans but planning for the more than human in cities and that's been a really interesting, uh, interesting journey to go on and I'm hoping that, that those ideas will be applied in practical ways in the future. Um, I'd like to ask anyone on the panel if they had thoughts about what, what are the next steps for future cities? What do we need to do next to, in all these different uh, areas to make our cities better for people, uh, but better for nature as well? Lee. Um, so I've been watching some of the work that you've been producing on um, like the three category approach and um, encouraging researchers to, to engage more closely with um, Indigenous Australians and it's been really interesting and I've sort of been watching and observing and I haven't really done a lot in this space yet but I do think that's where the, the future of, of urban ecology is, is to sort of merge a lot more with um, Aboriginal culture. So um, I've been trying... You know, our strategy has actions about caring for country and improving improving that, but it's not an easy space to step into. So I've just sort of been watching and reading and thinking. Um, and the city's building its capacity um, through our Aboriginal Melbourne team to provide internal support so that we can do some of that background um, learning before we go to traditional owners and custodians. So, um, and, you know, I've just been kind of working... Uh, up until now more in this pure biodiversity separate from culture sort of space um, and that's because we're kind of I'm just kind of thinking and planning and like we're going to do this right at some point so let's just kind of building some momentum um, but it's actually happening anyway regardless of what I'm um, my approach so you know that my job is to improve biodiversity in the city but actually where the push is coming from is from uh, other areas of council where they're trying to improve um, acknowledgement of Aboriginal culture in the city. So they're coming to me and saying, we should be using Indigenous plants. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> so, um, you know, it doesn't happen... Using Indigenous plants doesn't happen for nature's sake on its own. You know, there's so many competing priorities. The city is so complex and there's so many um, people arguing over every square metre of space and what should and shouldn't be done with it. Um, read the comments on social media for anything the city poses to do. It's just a, a minefield. So um, to have that kind of um, dual, not dual purpose, but common purpose for improving nature and improving um, representation and acknowledgement of Aboriginal culture, we're totally on the same page. We want the same things, as far as I can tell. Um, but it's just about um, getting, getting ourselves together and, like, you know, figuring out how to do it together. So... That's where I think the future is. Uh, Peter? I want to pick up on a, 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 um, 
part of Kirstine's narrative a little while back, and I was thinking about this as we're coming out of the pandemic, um, that this comment about the kinds of changes in the environment and events that Indigenous Australia has survived, I, I kind of think, ah, oh, you know, we've been quite proud of the fact in Victoria that we've been resilient against this and that in the last few months. You know, we've we've dealt with the fires in some sense or other, and we've kind of dealt with the pandemic. And then I think um, that's not really resilience. Um, 60,000 years through the kinds of environmental changes that we know have happened here in the past, that's resilience. And the thing I'd like to learn from that is a kind of learned optimism. Um, it's, to, to, to me, a, a problem uh, about the next steps we take in the city is not so much working out what they should be, but believing we can actually make them. Uh, and the kinds of, of stories of survival and success uh, and adaptation that, that characterise the deep history of Australia are what tell me that we, we have the kind of institutional capacity and individual capacity to actually learn to really make a difference, to, to, to push the city in directions that we think it should go. It'll be, a, it'll be an argument, as Lee said, you know, just, just look on, on social media for the discussions about differences of opinion about how we should do things. That's one thing. But the idea that we can make a difference, that, that we can shape the places we live in the directions that we want to go, that I think is maybe as important a lesson as we can learn from uh, recent and deep past of, of this place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on what Peter actually said. Um, you know, in a way, it's about the sort of appreciating the long now and uh, that appreciation of deep time, I feel, is so important because um, cities have only really occupied around 6% of human history. So our human history goes back hundreds of thousands of years as Homo sapiens, but cities have been a very small part of that. And even in geological time, it's, it's just minuscule. But in the future, the impact of our cities will be visible in a geological layer or even in an ev definitely in an evolutionary layer as well. And so the, the leverage that we have through city life to change the future is enormous. In fact, the, the present that we're living through at the moment. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that an indigenous understanding opens us up to by acknowledging country, for example, is that is that long past, because that's actually really important for, for the present. So. Last thoughts, Kirstine? Wow, we've, um, we've really seen a lot of great comments coming through here, and I'm really glad that everyone's thinking about cities as Indigenous places. Um, a lot of people think that Indigenous places are deserts, they have to have red dirt, they have to um, have wide open plains, but um, underneath here, underneath this, this gravel, this asphalt, the concrete, between all these buildings and underneath there's um, this, this place, community has been here for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, there's knowledge, there's deep knowledge in this place and our communities know that. Um, you don't have to tell uh, our mob, you know, where these special places are, where this connection is. It's, it's known intrinsically and the more you can connect with nature, with all the nuances of, of nature around you, um, nature will give back to us. Uh, it's, a, it's a full cycle where if you, if you protect and make better the environment around you, the environment will, it will treat you well back in return. So, thanks, Kirsten. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, so, uh, a final note from me uh, is to read one of the quotes from Jade Kennedy, a member of our Hubs Indigenous Advisory Group. And as part of our e-book, uh, there are two videos that um, the IAG have contributed to, including Kirstine here, uh, with their wisdom and insight about cities 
as Indigenous places and, and their vision for future cities. And this is Jade's vision. My vision is that we start to share the same dreaming, that we acknowledge our history and our story and how they came to be. And we acknowledge that moment where we turn the page and we move back into that old way of being custodians within a shared space. Thank you and thanks everybody for participating today. Hi everybody, welcome to the live Q&A session of Cities for People and Nature. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and watching. Uh, with us today we have Professor Kirsten Paris, who um, you've just seen moderated the conversation. Um, and we also have Kirsten Wallace as well, Kirsteen Wallace I should say. So um, Kirsteen and Kirsten will answer some of the questions that you've already put into the YouTube chat, but feel free to put any more questions in. Um, and yeah, over to you, Kirsten and Kirsteen. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, we've got a few questions that have come through already, so I can start by answering those. Uh, we've had a question about the Urban Wildlife app and how you can find more about the app and uh, the link for that will be posted in the chat. And also uh, the link to register to receive a copy of our ebook, Cities for People and Nature, will also be posted in the chat. Uh, we've had a question come through about uh, native plants and how well they absorb particulate pollution from the atmosphere. Uh, researchers in uh, our Wollongong. Um, University of Wollongong branch of the hub have done some really interesting work on uh, air pollution and how different plant species may absorb that. And a key finding of that was that uh, evergreen leaves, such as we find in eucalypts, will uh, retain the particulate pollution deeper in their leaves, uh, whereas for deciduous trees, uh, the part the particulates sit more on the surface of the leaf and so then they are washed off when it rains. And a second finding uh, with work led by Alison Haynes, which has been really fascinating, has looked at mosses and mosses in roadsides can absorb more particulate pollution than the trees do as well. Fascinating. I'm Fascinating. Going to be those so how how about those mosses? I love a good moss. Oh, I love a good moss too. <laughs> I really do. Um, Bruce Pascoe the other day was saying about um, companion planting with, with native plants and saying that the, um, the bulb, the rhizome plants, um, the myrnong and the bulbine lily um, traditionally had mosses planted between them. Wow. Um, which I just, you know, that it wouldn't be a, a mono mono crop. It'd be this is with Zena Cumston's talk um, with Bruce Pascoe for NADOC Week um, through the Zena's part of our call hub. She's our one of our researchers, and uh, I was really 
uh, chuffed to see her talk with Bruce. It was beautiful and it's easy to look up as well. So, um, yeah, love a good moss. Love mm. a good moss. Mm. Uh, yeah, so uh, for those interested in the air quality work, um, much of this has been published in the special issue of Atmosphere and all those papers are publicly available if you go to our Call Hub website as well. If you're looking for the, uh, the original research that that information's drawn from. Uh, another question about air quality, Kirstine, about the impact of wood heaters, uh, domestic wood heaters on PM 2.5 pollution in Victoria. And one of our questioners is concerned about um, how we might uh, prevent this type of pollution increasing and in fact work to, to um, tackle it. So the, the air quality work related to wood heaters that our hub has done has been focused in New South Wales, but we did find that during the winter, uh, wood smoke pollution could be significant in particular locations. And I know it's the same for uh, other cities around Australia. Uh, some of the cities in Tasmania as well experience quite uh, poor air quality in winter because of the nature of the geographic location, if they're sitting in a basin, uh, plus there's a higher proportion of people using wood heating in the winter. Uh, so the work that we've done is demonstrating that that's a significant issue that can be uh, considered by regulators. And Kirstine, you might have um, noticed over the winter months, there were quite a few articles in the paper. In Melbourne, people were concerned about wood heaters in the city and and looking for local governments to act um, mm. to prevent, uh, you know, basically to limit people's use of, of wood burning heaters in their homes. Yeah, and I wonder what about fire pits? Um, fire pits in the backyard, fire pits are very popular. Um, I guess it'd be the same for that, which I love a good fire pit. Oh, anyway, um, it's, it, it is a concern and you, and you think about your neighbours when you're doing it. And um, yeah, we all have to be responsible people and do the best we can to reduce air particulates for, for everyone. You know, think about it, ride a bike instead of driving your car. Um, yeah, now we've got another question come through. Parklets are proliferating in the city of Port Phillip, bookended with locally indigenous plants supplied by Billy Nursery in Williamstown Road, Port Melbourne. That's a great nursery. Um, yeah, so parklets, it's great to see, um, yeah, especially with um, indigenous plantings. Um, there's a lot that are just astroturf. Um, I've seen a lot of these, these um, small spaces that are maybe, you know, six to 12 metres long. Um, you know, about a couple car parks or a few a few car parks, but then just astroturf and plastic chairs. <laughs> it's when they're done well, though. If they've got um, if they've got beautiful beautiful planting that the insects and the birds and the people and everyone can can appreciate and benefit from, um, oh, it's good good for your mental mental health. Good for you your well-being overall and for a lot of people living in um, local environments that don't have access to um, a really good nature reserve or a, or a really good creek line, um, these little breakout pop-up parks can be that social solution, that mental health solution that people need. Um, Good there are a number of um, local government areas across Melbourne have been engaged in a pocket park initiative. So mm -hmm. uh, this, this uh, correspondent mentioned City of Port Phillip, but I know City of Stonington and other areas are also looking at pocket parks, um, probably a little bit bigger than the parklets you're thinking, Kirstine, and uh, bigger and more permanent, mm, but good. still... Um, even small areas that are planted with uh, locally indigenous plants can provide really important habitat for invertebrates and other small scale biodiversity for birds. Uh, and if they're connected, 
through links, uh, you know, even better if we've got connectivity between them across the city, then mm. uh, ground dwelling animals can move in as well. So, yeah, some mm. really exciting initiatives out there. Yeah, I've designed a few pocket parks. Um, yeah, they're, they're lovely to transform an underutilised bit of land, um, something that's that's in, in dire need of, of a bit of a refurb, but actually putting purpose um, across community and to our, our biodiversity in the city. It's, um, it's really good stuff. And great to see people engaging with it too. Okay, next question. Burning wood impacts air quality and increases global warming. Wood collection impacts habitat and tree loss. Health impacts costed at billions, how can we get better holistic approaches across silos? Oof, mm. that's a big question. Mm. Uh, I think that um, part of the way we can do this is to bring all those different uh, different sources of evidence together in a holistic way. So, at the uh, at the present time, for example, in our hub, the work that we've done on smoke has focused on smoke from bushfires, particularly over the most recent season of bushfires where air quality was very poor in cities, uh, as well as the, the ongoing um, seasonal pollution from wood burning smoke. So our air quality boffins were on the job there. We haven't yet connected in with the ecologists uh, who might be able to measure the impacts on habitat of wood collection. And uh, also the, uh, we could connect in with Jane Hayworth and her team who are looking at the uh, population health impacts of smoke and the, the health economics of that. So I think it's a really great suggestion and um, a, a really great opportunity to bring those different uh, different fields of research together to address the, the question holistically. I'm not aware of any study that has done this yet, uh, but something to pursue in the future, definitely. Uh, I think um, a, a sort of a, a similar and related issue is to do with um, coal burning power stations, which are still uh, providing a significant proportion of electricity in Victoria. Uh, the people who live in the Latrobe Valley, uh, where much of our um, coal burning power stations are located, have suffered um, the health consequences of poor air quality over decades. But those, um, those impacts are rarely factored in when we're considering the costs and benefits of the different, um, different electricity generation approaches. And I think, again, a, a holistic approach would be are very valuable. And comparative, uh, I love seeing the big, the big graphs and charts, you know, comparing the amounts. Um, it tends to have breakthrough for visual people like me. Um, yeah, I like to see the amounts. There's another question through here. I wonder if either of you have any specific ways of personally making the most of this time of pandemic? Any activities, actions, rituals, or practices that relate to engaging with nature? Would you like to go first, Kirstine? Well, I think I had a bit of a yarn about my, uh, my lockdown practices. Um, yeah, I found that while I was getting a bit, you know, Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day, I tended to actually really try and make the most of that and when you when you confine to the the same repetition it's seeing the detail seeing that um that extra level of detail in your local environment was really special for me like as a landscape architect I'm a bit of a nerd with these sort of things and I love to see um how everything is connected within an environment even a, an urban environment the the creek that I that I was hanging out at um, is actually quite a concrete drain um, it, it used to be a creek um, but yeah massive concrete stormwater drain and um, 
but seeing seeing the relative um, environment around that and how you know I was right near the the freeway, but the amount of tree canopy um, sheltered the noise from that from that freeway um, and seeing all the all the habitat the birds the insects um you know i'd look at logs and see you know during winter the the fungi coming out um looking at the the black anther flax lilies and looking at those um rhizome type plants and um looking at my my diary of when when these things should be flowering and then comparing to what i'm seeing um yeah, just looking at the timing of things. And um, I found quite, even though it was the same walk, every walk was, was different. Every, every walk, you know, when the, when the parakeets and came out and the flash of colour in their wings and it was just the most, this is, hi, birds, how are you going? Nice to see you, really good to see you, you know. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I'm and then I get my watercolors out and do some drawing. So every walk, you know, I try to do um, six to ten k, um, same walk, same walk, same walk. But um, I do something a little bit different each week, and that would break it up. So the the citizen science apps, um, counting, noticing, um, appreciating. Um, all, all that is connected around us, even in an urban environment when you're trapped from seeing the big horizons and seeing those, um, those special places that you're used to being able to go to, um, seeing the, the beauty and the detail of the places where you are, um, I think was, was pretty cool. It, it made me grow. It made me grow as a person, yeah. I am... Um... I felt quite constrained. Uh, I live in um, an inner suburb of Melbourne and uh, my family has uh, a block of 40 acres in the country where I, you know, I have a very strong connection to that place. It's up towards Bendigo in the Jajarung uh, country. And I couldn't go there um, for more than four months. And I felt I felt a real sadness about that um, because that was a, a space I had a, a connection to since um, I was a teenager, which is a while ago now. <laughs> and uh, it's this a space I used to go to have alone time with nature. So I might go up for a few days by myself, commune with the frogs, the birds. We've got beautiful old um, red gums and other trees there some of which are you know, very old mm. uh, and the rocks as well. I love the granite boulder. And uh, so it was sad that I couldn't connect there. Uh, the ritual that uh, my family developed through the lockdown was to go for a walk in the evening after dinner. And uh, we would watch for possums. We'd see a lot of ring ringtail possums, flying foxes, tawny frog mouths. And even in this inner urban part of Melbourne, uh, we could connect with nature that we wouldn't normally have done just because that wasn't a practice uh, for all of us to do it. In the, in the hard lockdown period, we weren't all three of us allowed to walk together because mm. only two people from each household could go at a time. And uh, so we'd sort of, we'd break it up and two would go one day and two would go the next evening. It wasn't quite the same. So it's nice that we can all walk together again now. Mm. How much did you find that um, when you do go on these walks, it kind of resets your, your, your mental health, you know, it just gives you a grounding? Did you, did you find that it was It, it was beneficial. beneficial. Uh, I think otherwise I, um, I avoided going to parks during the day because there were too many people, actually. Mm. I'm a bit of a, a germaphobe, even when there isn't a pandemic on. So I, I found going to the park during the day when it was busy um I couldn't relax so I'd only go at night time <laughs> yeah I've yeah I've had you know talked to a lot of my friends about it and really depended on where you were in Melbourne Metro very different experience very diverse experience um 
the more more popular traditionally popular places in Melbourne the most populated um, tended to be the worst places that you could you could be and you know they you know my friends that lived in live in these places um, you know the the harassment of too many people being on a path too many cyclists too many um, yeah it, it it was hard for a lot of people um, you know caused anxiety for a lot of people so the need for um, more open space more public publicly accessible um, places with amenities that people can benefit from uh, I think this pandemic's really highlighted that some LGAs really need to pick their socks up within this area and provide these necessary spaces for for their their community oh. i've had a few more questions come through i think i could have talked about that one a bit longer so apologies if that was a long answer uh so what small things would you suggest we can do as individuals to improve our urban areas relationship with nature and and improve air quality so I think uh, there are a lot of things we can do to connect with nature in the city and probably Kirstine and I have just mentioned a number of those, which is taking the time to connect in a, a, a kind of mindful way with your local environment, even if it's not, um, uh, not particularly biodiverse or pristine in any sense, uh, even, even very small areas of green space or even our, our street trees, our gardens do still provide a lot of biodiversity. I used to um, watch pollinators in my garden. That was my daytime activity to engage with nature and take lots of photos, uh, partly from my students because I was teaching community ecology and interspecific interactions. So I was getting up a, a library of, of photos and videos then. Uh, improving air quality, there's, there's a range of things we can do and some of those we chatted about earlier in this session. Uh, in addition to considering um, reducing wood, wood burning where possible, if people have other options for heating, particularly in built up urban areas, that would be one thing to consider. Also, uh, a lot of our air pollution in cities comes from vehicular, vehicular traffic so pollutions that come from our cars. So driving less where possible, riding your bike or walking or possibly taking public transport if that's COVID safe. Uh, those are some things to do. If you have the capacity to consider switching to a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle, those will reduce uh, all, um, all the different types of emissions we get from vehicles. So couple of really key things to do for outdoor air. Uh, Anne Steinerman, Nigel Goodman and colleagues in our hub have also done really interesting work on indoor air quality. And we spend most of our time indoors, up to 90% of our day is spent indoors. So the quality of the air in our houses and in our workplaces when we're there uh, is really important for our health. And lots of really common products that we see in households uh, can have negative impacts on air quality and can also influence people's health. So a lot of fragranced products um, emit a variety of vol volatile organic compounds, which can be uh, problematic for people's health in terms of asthma, um, migraine, headaches, and uh, other, other types of symptoms. So a great thing to do is to take those fragrance products out of your home. So rather than using fragrance laundry powder, go to unfragranced. Uh, everybody is, everybody, many people are very keen on the scented candle, the incense, the little air wicky things that you plug in and it's, it um, produces all sorts of fragrancy fumes. Um, if you're sensitive to those fragrances, removing them from your home is a really effective way to improve indoor air quality and also uh, improve health. And what about putting, I see a beautiful array of um, indoor plants behind you. Um, how... That's actually just one, 
That is one giant plant. plant. <laughs> yes. It's a monster. It's monstera. a monster monstera. It just loves it here. It used to be in my office at the university and it was very sad there. It didn't have enough light. But now it's really enjoying being, it's enjoying working from home. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, indoor plants can also uh, really help indoor air quality as well. Yeah. How many do we know the, you know, per square metre, how many plants we should aim for to to make a difference in a room well uh there is an app for that the mm. plant life app uh, wow. which colleagues from our hub and other collaborators have developed so i'd encourage people to check that out i'm going to check that out when i cut off this talk <laughs> <laughs> um we are seeing a correlation between high urban heat low open space in older suburban areas are pocket parks better than no parks at all yes i would have to say yes um the the amount of green space um, versus concrete um, and asphalt um, the more permeable surfaces that we can have that where the water can come through um that the more the more habitat for for our biodiversity and the more um, social spaces that we can enjoy a bit of time in the outdoors. Um, these are, and, and mingling, even just seeing other community um, is really important for our mental health. So um, absolutely, um, even if they're small parks, um, those, those spaces between the glass, the concrete, the asphalt um, is, is really important. Um, I'd, um, I'd also add that uh, we're often constrained by ground level space in cities, particularly in the, the older areas, and it, it's very difficult to retrofit parks in where there's, there's uh, so, much of the, um, so much of the surface is already taken up with buildings, roads and other, other urban infrastructure. So this is where we can also consider um, alternative greening approaches to cool the local environment. So uh, rooftop gardens, green roofs are, are a feature. Sky parks. sky parks are becoming a big thing. Sky parks. Um, for sky parks, yes, with, um, <laughs> with big, um, big builds. So um, some of the more innovative um, big community builds are um, using sky bridges, sky parks to connect, um, connect apartments, um, connect community and apartments, and also connect to public spaces. So um, making that that transition between private and public space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a that's a a big thing happening now. Um, getting that elevated level, um, yeah, and vertical gardens, absolutely. Big, um, big push for for using the the exterior of a building or even the the internal atriums. Um, yeah, having a, a vertical planting space, um, you'd be amazed how many plants you can get in there, um, and how much the the biodiversity engages with it. It's um, yeah, it's beautiful. I've I've been lucky to be in a lot of environments where and work in environments that have got amazing vertical gardens yeah yeah so I think that that's something to consider as well that often um, we think about you know to have a park that's valuable it need we need big spaces and certainly if we still do have big open green spaces they're very valuable and should be protected in the urban environment but we can also make space for for nature and for biodiversity and for people to connect with nature in much smaller spaces, both public spaces and private spaces as well. So uh, we can be versatile and uh, take advantage of a variety of different opportunities that cities present. Mm. Yeah, when we've got so much um, growth happening in our urban um outer urban areas, big, big um, growth zones, um, we need to, to make up for that 
that growth by putting putting back. Um, we can't just keep take take taking from our from our country. Uh, we have to give back as much or more than we're taking out. Thanks, Kirsty. That's a great way to wrap up. <laughs> So thank you, everybody, for participating, uh, for coming along and watching our M Talk, and also for participating in this Q&A session. It's been really fabulous uh, to be part of the conversation and to engage with you. So thank you very much. Thanks for some great questions, everyone. Yeah. And thanks, Kirsten. And thanks, M Pavilion, for having us. Thank you very much, Kirstine and Kirsten, for giving us the time to be part of this live Q&A. Thank you, everybody, for watching.